You over there, stop talking. Get back in line. Tuck your shirt in. Those were the three lines that resonated with me most from my high school experience. In my high school, we valued discipline. And a big part of this discipline was based around our compliance with school rules and standards. Every morning, before the bell rang and our school day started, my classmates and I were made stand silently in single form for a flag raising ceremony. And once it was over, and as we walked towards our classroom, we were each scanned closely from head to toe. Whether it was a smudge of eyeliner, a streak of hair dye, or even an untucked shirt, any student with a feature that singled them out from the rest of the group was called from the line, handed a punishment, and made to rearrange themselves before they could rejoin the group. Now for the 13-year-old me, that was quite a terrifying experience. Just like any other kid, I hated punishment. And the only way to avoid it at my school was my making sure that you looked like everyone else. So I decided I wasn't going to take any risks. And I started to actively mask any detail or ism that defined me from the rest of the group and defined me as an individual. And over time, I actually became quite great at making sure that my differences were almost invisible. The more I made sure to act and behave according to the rules of whatever group I was in, the more stronger my mask got and the less myself I felt. And through this process, I was made to believe that my own voice had no value. And for eight hours a day, five days a week, that was the message that was repeatedly reinforced within my mind. At the time, though, I really believed that my mask was my magical shield. The more and more comfortable I grew behind it, the more I started to see it as such a powerful tool because it allowed me to avoid any form of shame or punishment. And so I started to wear my mask everywhere because it made me feel safe. I wore my mask outside of my school campus, in public, with my friends, and sometimes even at home. I stayed obedient, I started to take less risks, and I suppressed and suppressed and suppressed. And as a young girl, I had quite a strong influence on the person that I grew up to be. And so what eventually ended up happening was I realized that my, my mask or my powerful tool was actually an invis invisible shield. It started to make me feel isolated from everyone else around me. And the more I wore it, the more I started to feel secluded from everyone else. And over time, this process not only made me feel secluded and lost, but it made me feel as though I had zero voice. And eventually, I grew so unaware of this mask, which one day I forgot to take off, and it became a permanent part of my wardrobe. Years went by, and I still wore my mask. It wasn't really until much later in my life, in a single moment that I faced during my freshman year at AUK, that things started to shift for me. It was a literature elective, and my professor had turned around and stared at me in a class of 25 students, asking me to share my interpretation and my thoughts on a poem. And it all came rushing back. All the fear and the shame that I fought so hard to avoid throughout high school. I even had instant flashbacks to my days in uniform. But what I hadn't realized back then was that in that moment, my professor, I wasn't being singled out by my professor to face punishment. Instead, and for what felt like the first time ever, I was being asked to share my thoughts and what Ezra Pound's haiku in a station of the metro meant to me. And I struggled so hard at first to give my analysis. It was just that the idea of perspective taking was so foreign to me. I, before, up until that point, I would constantly analyze things in my mind when I was reading books or listening to stories but I was never really asked or ever comfortable with the idea of sharing these thoughts out loud. And so in that classroom, with every student, each one of us were giving our subjective understandings of the poem. And I still remember the exact moment very clearly to this day, how I felt after my interpretation of that poem in that moment was considered to be just as valid as anyone else in that room. That day, we interpreted the poem over 25 different ways, 
based on each of the interpretations and the subjective understandings of the students in the classroom. And with every contribution, our collective understanding of Pounds' words, his intentions and their implications became more clear and connected and more layered. And by the end of this process, my body felt numb. As the students in my class filed out of the classroom, I sat in my chair feeling completely entranced. I was mesmerized. I was mesmerized by the amount of perspectives that were represented in that one room and how together our individual and collective understanding created this much richer and much deeper interpretation of that poem. That day, I set aside, I set aside my mask for good. And in fact, as soon as I regained my composure after class, I marched right into the registrar's office to process my paperwork and declare a minor in English literature. And I felt liberated. Human narratives, whether literary or oral, became a tool through which I could make sense of the world around me and connect to experiences outside of my own. By actively listening, sharing, and reading, I became a collector, not of tangible materials, but of intangible stories that were generously provided to me by a diverse range of people I invited into my life and invited me into theirs. And by sharing these stories, I was able to connect with a whole group of people, and I was able to find common threads in our experiences, and I was able, able to better empathize with others, and even myself. Stories not only reconnected me to myself and my own voice, they also fed my curiosity for human narratives. And it was this curiosity that underpinned the next stage in my discovery, which was the creation of an oral history initiative with my older sister and two friends of mine. As Palestinians, born and raised to Kuwaiti and Jordanian parents raised in the Gulf, we each felt a sense of loss and yearning to form a closer connection to our Palestinian culture and heritage. We were curious. We wanted to know more about what it really was that created that intimate bond which unites our displaced community, that connects us to this large group of people. And so, off we went. The whole experience was very spontaneous. And really what later became our project, Hekayitna, started with this collective curiosity that we each felt and the strong pull that we felt towards the stories of others within our community. And when we got there, we started our journey in Jordan. And we got there, we only had two contacts and a ton of audacity. And we took with us what we later discovered was a faulty camera and a small recording device that we each pooled our savings to buy. Again, it was very spontaneous. And the spontaneity carried forward throughout the entire seven days that we were there. With every home that we visited, we really did not know what we were going to, what to expect or what would be waiting for us on the other side. And every single time, we were faced with the same degree of warmth and openness and willingness by each individual who shared with us their most personal life histories and memories. These people, who we were strangers to, took us into their homes and treated us as if we were their own daughters. They walked us through their recollected memories one after the other, and they paused every now and then to gather photos from their family albums. Um, some of them even shared with us the tale behind every stitch in the embroidered gowns that they had created with their own two hands and their personal collections of poetry. One of the lovely old men that we met had even led us into the collection of poems that his father had written in his earlier years. And as he read out their beautiful verses to us one after the other, we were all moved to tears, including himself. It was almost as if in that moment, time and matter stood still and we were all transported back to that time when his father was writing these words and was feeling the agony that he was pouring into the, into the paper that we were then listening to that his son was reading out to us. And before we left his home, he insisted that we each kept a copy of his father's poems and he kept with us a very sacred piece of his family's narrative. And as we left, by the end of our trip, we had come across a whole range of people that we both planned to meet and that fell into our path. 
We came closer to the rich history of our hometown, Palestine, and took long walks through its cities, vicariously through the stories that were told to us by the people that we met. When we were visiting the refugee camps, we were welcomed with the same degree of warmth and hospitality in absolutely every corner. And through this process, we were not only reconnected or connected newly to this whole group of people and this large community, it also connected us, the young women collecting these narratives more deeply to our Palestinian identity. And whilst listening to their narratives, I realized that my deepest sense of identity was shaped by the stories I was told as a child. They were shaped not by the land of my birth or of my passport, but the stories of my community. And it was the very impact of this, these stories that not only shaped my Palestinian identity, but also shaped our collective Palestinian identity. No matter where we were in the world, these were the stories that created the strong bond that connected us together. As a third generation Palestinian, my cultural identity is not based on a lived experience. It is inherited through post memories, through a collection of stories that were shared to me by my father, that were shared to him by his father. And through the gathering and sharing of stories, the scattered experiences of the Palestinians across the diaspora are connected and a collective sense of community is created and passed down from one generation to the next. And so this got me thinking. If this was possible in my community among strangers, could it be possible among strangers in other communities? What could become possible if each of us listened to, shared, and understood each other's personal stories and journeys? The stories we tell are more than stories. They are used as a way to make us feel as though we have a shared history, values, and cultures even across differences. I see this now to be true in the work that I do in community building in Kuwait, where stories create shared meaning, they create empathy, and they help us address our shared community issues. While storytelling now has become such a crucial community building tool around the world, I realized that this was nothing new to our cultural heritage, which allows me to finally introduce to you all the Hakawati. Historically, the custom of storytelling was considered to be the most popular form of entertainment in the Arab world. It was represented by a group of people that were more, most commonly known as the Hakawati. And these storytellers went from village to village and shared traditional t tales and fables and legends which served to create shared meaning across disparate cultures. And so we can see that community building and st that stories, sorry, have been used as a way to make people feel a sense of agency and as a tool, community building tool since time began. But we are only now rediscovering the power of this tool as we realize that it connects us in ways that technology and other means of communication don't. So by returning to this culture of sharing oral traditions and stories, we can start to create safe spaces for people to understand one another's perspective create shared meaning, and create innovative solutions to the issues facing their communities. Storytelling moves us from uniformity to collectivity. It forces us to take down our masks, embrace the other, and create shared meaning. It gives us agency and gives us power. So what if we honored people's stories and celebrated the power of diversity instead of enforcing uniformity and enforcing complacency? What if we became enablers of each other's agencies and shared the stories which truly connect us to one another? I'll leave you with one last thought. In the words of Maya Angelou, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. So I urge you all today to take down your masks and share your untold stories. Thank you.